Hello everyone. Today we have the most amazing author on our podcast. Her name is Annette Oppenlander and she's with us all the way from Germany. Hello Annette, how are you? Hello Angelina, I'm great. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. It's wonderful of you to come on the podcast and to be with us today. Thank you so much for that. Annette Oppenlander is an award-winning writer, literary coach and educator. As a best-selling historical novelist, she is known for her authentic characters and stories based on true events coming alive in well-researched settings. Her best-selling true World War II story, Surviving the Fatherland, won multiple awards and was recently translated into German. She shares her knowledge through writing workshops at colleges, libraries, festivals and schools. She's the mother of fraternal twins and a son, and she recently returned to her home, Solingen, in Germany, where she lives with her husband. That sounds amazing. Annette, where did you come from? Where did you move from to return home? Well, um, I first of all, I, I grew up in Germany, and then after my degree in business, I went to the U.S. to work there for a year, and then I met my husband over there. He's American, and I stayed 30 years. Oh, and then, <laughs> as you um, do. In 2017, we decided to move back here, so since then, I've been back in my hometown, which is quite strange, to be honestly, <laughs> after that long time. <laughs> <laughs> you must feel like a stranger, here. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it must be quite lovely to be back in a place where you had your childhood. Yes, uh, there are a lot of memories that I am revisiting now, mm -hmm. even just walking the streets, you know, seeing old neighborhoods. And it's also that sense of home. I don't know if you've ever lived abroad or, you know, if somebody moves far away, then all of a sudden that love for home grows very large. <laughs> and so I had this sense of, now nah, homesickness is maybe overdone. I was homesick in the beginning, and then I was sometimes homesick at certain times when things happened. But overall, I think you always have that sort of urge to want to go back to where you where your roots are and I was very I'm very lucky that I had those roots and I was able to go back here now and um, see my dad again who's oh. now 91 gosh yes so, <laughs> so yeah it's it's been great I actually do know exactly what you mean because I was born in Namibia which is very far away from where I live now in the UK and I lived all over the world when I was still singing. So I know what you mean. Wow. And, and the, yeah. the yearning to return to the desert and just sit there is sometimes overwhelming. And sometimes I give in to it, I have to say. That's probably a good thing to do, you know, if you have the chance to yeah. revisit those feelings and memories. I think that's a wonderful thing. It feeds your soul, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Which brings me on to why we're having a chat today. I want to talk to you about love. I am deeply interested in why writers and authors write about love, return to it, why it's a theme through their books, what it means to them, and obviously why we read it. So I'd love to know your thoughts about that, please. Well, I think, I, first of all, I have to say I'm, I'm a historical novelist, mm -hmm. not an author who writes pure romance. Right. But I have to say that all my stories, and I've now published 10 books. Mm -hmm. um, wow. 10 full length Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All my stories have a love interest. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's more in the foreground, sometimes it's not. But it is always a portion of the story. Now, why is it so important? You know, there are actually movies out there. I was thinking about this earlier today. Mm -hmm. So what, what is it about a story that, that makes it so interesting and appeals to us as humans? Right. And sometimes you watch a movie mm -hmm. that has absolutely no love in it. Mm. There are some of these action movies where there are lots of things happening, but nothing in the, in the field of love. Nothing, not even an indication. 
And I always feel a little shortchanged when that happens. I think it's it's such a basic need for humans mm. to have this, or maybe it's a search for love. Oh. Because, <laughs> yes. That so, is um, something. And of course, in the book, in our stories, we mm. can make up things yes. as authors, mm -hmm. even though I, I can talk about that later. I have also some biographical work mm -hmm. that is not made up, and that is also a love story. I believe that we all are looking for that perfect love. And it's, I think, very rare that we find the, what we call this perfect love relationship. And so maybe when we read books and we write books, we create these stories to make those really perfect relationships. We create them artificially. And maybe that is also why so many people read them, because... Well, they want to, if they can't have it in real life, yeah. they at least want to have it in a book. Right. Like and escaping to it, in a way. Exactly. And I think maybe that is also why, what the romance genre is the most read genre out there. There's just that sense that people need to escape somewhere and find this perfect person, uh, female or male, and that, that will connect with them on, on this perfect level. And that's really hard to do in real life, especially in the long term. Yes, I agree with you. It really is. I don't know how long you've been married. I've been married for 28 years. <laughs> yes, it's I long. am working on 32 right oh, now. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so you know whereof you speak. <laughs> yes, yes. It is difficult. It is an ongoing piece of work, a marriage, yes. isn't it? It's yes. an art. It's almost like a piece of art that you... Mm -hmm building together. I agree with you. I think it is true that we are yearning to find that special love connection. But what is very interesting to me is why we want to find it, what it is. Because, you know, especially these days online, you see all these people talking about self-love, that you first have to fill up yourself, you first have to love yourself, and then you can love another. Now, I'm not denigrating that. I'm not saying it's wrong. I think there is truth to it. Of course there is. But it is therefore very perplexing and intriguing to me as to why people are looking for another person when really they should be full of their own love, that they are complete. They don't need anyone else, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's certainly a provoking question. Well, I, I would say, first of all, we are social animals. Mm -hmm. So, and as such, we need other people. Now, of course, there are exceptions. There are hermits, people who do not like other people or prefer to be alone. Even, even people who may not have a partner may want social relationships with others. And I think, as, as a whole, the, the human being needs other people. And I think that became very clear, at least to me, during this corona crisis, mm. because all of a sudden, not only could I not see people, yes, I could talk to them on the phone, but I could not hug. And I used to not be such a hugger, but now that I cannot hug, it really is something that I'm missing. So this social level of connecting with others is very important. And I think when you see old people in the retirement homes mm. who can now not be visited, hugged, they sort of shrivel. Yes. And I think we all shrivel a little mm. when we don't have this. And I think love then because is maybe something of a higher level of this social relationship with others, more in depth, you know, more intense, usually just with one person in most cases. I agree with you. It's very well documented about the orphans in Romania where people would go in and they would see these cots with toddlers rocking themselves because there was nobody to touch them and hug them. So your comment about hugging people, because I'm a major hugger too, reminded me of that. This is why this whole love thing intrigues me so much. I agree with you that romance, yes, it is the widest read readers who read eight books a week or more, right? There is that. But I wonder, as you say, whether love has a higher purpose, whether there is something that we're not actually finding 
we know it's there, we can feel it, this is why we want it, but we can't put our finger on what it is. And I am determined <laughs> to find it. I want to find out what it is. And this is why I'm doing this series of interviews. At the moment, mm -hmm. I'm interviewing authors, but I will eventually also talk to readers about why they read about love. As authors, of course, we read too. So it's a double whammy in a way that I'm covering here. Along those same lines, I uh, recently finished a novel that is based on um, the reports of war children. Um, in Germany, there was a program that Hitler put out in 1940 where he said he wanted to send all German children away from their parents Ooh. for a all sorts of lengths of time. What he wanted to do was he wanted to put a basically a separation between the parents and the kids so that he or his, let's say, the Hitler youth or whoever was in charge would have better influence to raise those children as national socialists. Gosh, yes, okay. For, for none was this more so for, than for the youth. The people, the, the kids 10 to 14 were supposed to go to camps. And from those German camps, there were thousands. And there were about 2 million kids in these camps oh and various parts of the program. Mm. There exist some reports, some videos, some writings, what they actually experience. And based on the, those, I actually wrote this novel. Mm -hmm. And... There's a scene in it about a girl, one of the two protagonists, there's a girl and a boy, mm -hmm. again, we have the classic two. Right. Um, the girl is, a, is a really a strong reader, and her teacher had given her a book to read, mm -hmm. um, she, and this was a forbidden book. There were many, many books that were forbidden during the Third Reich that were burned right, I remember. by authors who yeah. were not uh, going along with what Hitler liked. So this girl is, had, had a book that was forbidden, and she went on this into this camp at a cloister, and the SS came to actually control, investigate the rooms where the girls were staying. Oh. Well, of course, the girl still had the book. And she didn't know where to hide it, oh, gosh. because had she been found out, it would have been pretty awful. So she ended up sticking it into her underwear, okay. and then trying not to move. Oh. So this is sort of the scene when <gasps> these guys come in there, and you know they take down the cross in the room and put a Hitler portrait up in the room, and and so on. It's right. it's just a little scene. And books weren't just forbidden for Jewish people or in the concentration camps, but there were a lot of culture was burned and destroyed uh, that was, well, basically critical of the regime. Mm -hmm. That's so sad. It is a kind of destroying of love, though. I, if you separate people, I mean, it reminds me actually of the situation we're in now where we are separated, as you said earlier, and people are really missing human connection and human touch. Some of us are lucky, we are with family members and and some people are alone. And you can see the terrible mental anguish and trouble with mental health that is happening as a result. And this is why I keep coming back to this. I wonder if love has a higher purpose, whether there is something to do with our souls that we haven't quite understood yet. That we think, oh, well, it's a romantic love or it's a platonic love. It's a love between parents and children or friends or whatever. Of course, those kinds of love are extremely important and they make up all of who we are, don't they? We all mm -hmm. have these facets and that is why we have many different friends because they all fill and fulfill something of that kind of love for us with them. But I have myself experienced the death of a very, very close friend and it derailed me completely. It mm. took me six years to get to the point where I can now do this. Mm -hmm. And I wrote about it. I wrote a novel about it. My point is this. I think, I don't know if you agree, 
But again, it's something I'm going to put out there and see what you say. I feel that on a soul level, on a spiritual level, we are connected to certain people. They come into our lives and we immediately connect with them. And it doesn't actually even sometimes matter how long we've known them. It's the depth of the connection that matters. And I wonder if there's something beyond just this physical, because we know that we each embody a soul. And so are those souls part of us? Well, that's a good question. I really don't know because we talk about soul and sometimes I write about it in my stories uh, when I want to express something that goes very deep. But on a physical level, we cannot really define what that is because we cannot find it. It's not an organ. Right. It's something very metaphysical and not really to be grasped. Right. And yet we have this sense there is more. And what you were just saying about feeling this connection sometimes with somebody who we hardly know. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can totally attest to this. Uh, a few years ago, I met a yoga teacher, a wonderful woman, who I immediately connected to on a level that, that kind of baffled me myself. She's actually a Jewish woman. Right. Wonderful. Love her. And... Why? I have no idea. I cannot tell you mm -hmm. why. But I would say, yes, there's some something inside us that connects us. And it was basically from both sides. She's in the U.S., I am here, and of course we communicate, but right. uh, we don't really see each other again, yes. uh, at this point at least. Um, but yes, there is that. And I could not tell you exactly why. <laughs> It is perplexing, isn't it? Because love is also metaphysical. We can't touch it, we can't smell it, we can't breathe it in, and yet it is overwhelming and it is in all of our society. I mean, people use love to advertise products and, as we said, the romance genre is one of the most read genres there is and has been for a very long time. This is why it's all very perplexing to me. So it is one of the reasons why I talk to authors and writers to ask when they write a love story, whether it's platonic or romantic, it doesn't really matter. But is it something that they yearn for, as you said earlier, something that they haven't got in their own lives? Or do you think writers write stories that we have experienced and that it is a kind of lesson in a way that we put out there in our books? Well, I think something from us f always flows into the story. And I think whatever emotions we have experienced somehow find a way into onto the page. Mm -hmm. They do. Um, whether I have experienced exactly the type of emotion that I'm describing in a book, I don't think so. I don't think it has to be that way. Mm -hmm. But I do think that I draw from the emotions that I have experienced over my life. And I'm not so young anymore, so... I have quite a pot full of things that I've gone through, mm -hmm. which is great in some ways. For writing, it really is good because it just does give a, a roundness to things, right. an experience level that is good to have when we try to explain things and describe them in a story. Obviously, we're talking as writers to each other, but I find that love is in all art and it mm -hmm. is a healing force. As a performer, I remember standing on stage watching the audience and if it's a particularly moving piece of music, you can see them being touched and mm -hmm. sometimes even crying. And you can see that standing on stage. Now, yes, I've, so I've experienced it as a performer looking at an audience and I've also experienced it being in an audience looking at performers. Do you feel then, therefore, and I know this is a question, I know the answer already, but I want to know your take on it. When people read our books, do you think that it has a similar response from them when they read about love? Well, I do know that people have a reaction because they have commented, I have this particular book about World War II, which is a biographical love story of my parents, oh, um, and it's wonderful. kind of a coming-of-age story called Surviving the Fatherland, and that story won a number of awards. That's but wonderful. Congratulations. Well, thank you. 
Yes, I had a, a lot of comments from readers, and they have commented and told me in writing or sometimes in person that they cried in not just in one spot, but in various spots. Basically, something in the story resonated with the reader, mm -hmm. and they had a reaction that kind of took them by surprise, maybe. I don't know that those particular scenes or spots in the story were necessarily always based on the love relationship or whatever was going on, but I believe there, there was that. Sometimes they would actually comment a particular area that they were talking about. For instance, there's a scene at the very beginning when my mother sees her father go into the war. He leaves. She's seven years old. He's gone. Gosh. Day, from one day to another. This is 1940. Now, the story goes on and on and on for 13 years. And in 1953, he actually comes back because he spent almost nine years in a Russian gulag. Oh, gosh. And so this arc, the story arc, then takes her from a 70-year-old girl to a 20-year-old woman to this train station where the grandfather then, or her father then, my grandfather, right. shows up after 13 years. And she's basically standing there and feeling like, who is this man? I had this concept of who, who he was, but he's not. He's somebody else. And so she's kind of grappling with this. I'm trying to understand this person. Mm. And it's a very emotional scene on this on this platform where they're hugging. So things like that. Mm. This is obviously not a mm, love relationship. A very faulty daughter-father relationship. Mm -hmm. But it is definitely still there's there's a lot going on with something like that and that's always wonderful feedback when you get that from readers isn't it it makes you go okay i i hit the right note yes and as you say it doesn't necessarily mean that they have gone through it themselves but it's like when we watched movies you know you were talking earlier on about watching movies if you watch a movie and there's a, a particularly wonderful scene it really does pull on your heartstrings, doesn't it? And reading books is like watching movies. It's a movie that you watch in your head. And obviously everybody that reads your books see a different movie, don't they? So Yes, yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else you would like to say or add that you feel is important about love and the theme of love and what we can learn from it as readers? One thing that I find very interesting is when it comes to the love between partners, mm -hmm. is that it is always a sort of fleeting thing. It is not a permanent thing. How We're always you? looking for permanence, but we are not getting it. And that always fascinates me, and I don't know why. Why is that? Because you can probably remember a scene in your life where you met somebody and you are head over heels, and at some point that is gone. So it's something that we strive for, but we it, we cannot hold on to it. And I mean, there are maybe the occasional people who can, throughout their lives, always be on this fresh level, right. but very few, I think. Yes, that is, that is thought-provoking, isn't it? Because you're <laughs> right. It is absolutely true that, and so that's why people talk about the honeymoon period in any relationship, really, isn't it? So yes. after the honeymoon period is over, then <laughs> that sort of rose-tinted glasses and that feeling of euphoria seem to dissipate and leave. And so do you think, therefore, that's possibly one of the reasons why people read and write about love in the way that we do? We try to recreate that. I think that's actually a perfect answer. I think we've just found the answer <laughs> why people read. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to recreate the love. <laughs> yes, yes, especially romance novels do do this very well. So it's a way to add this part that we might not have in real life. Now, we may have had it at some point, but most people don't have it all the time. So this is how we get it back, you know, every week, a new <laughs> book, a new story. I think you're right. 
But it is sad, though. I hadn't ever thought about that. And in all the people I've interviewed, nobody's ever spoken about it the way that you have. I hadn't thought about that. But it is true, isn't it, that we are yearning for permanence. That's what we crave. And yet it is elusive for most mm -hmm. of us. For yes. I think you're right. There's only a very few people who are able to hold on to it and sustain it throughout their lives. And I'm not sure they can do it in the way that they had it in the beginning, because, of course, people expand, we change, we evolve. And I think yeah. if there's a couple who happen to be able to evolve and expand together in the same direction, then that could happen for them, that they could hold on to that kind of love. But for most of us, that doesn't happen. Even in a close marriage, we evolve and expand in different directions because we are and remain individuals. Yes, that's very well said. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so now we have to find out how to get the permanence. So that mm -hmm. is what I shall be chasing. <laughs> I okay. want to find out how to find that. Yes, because I think it is to do with also belonging and the truth of another person and knowing that it's forever. Yeah. Intriguing. <laughs> Well, my darling, we've come to the end of our interview. So I want to say thank you so much for joining us today. It was an absolute delight to talk to you. And I highly recommend that people go and find this multi-award winning book, because I am. Well, thank you, Angelina, for having me. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> I had no, not thought about love this way or from these many angles in quite a while. But this is great. It, it just helps to kind of refresh some of those approaches that we have in our stories and why we, you know, write a certain way. So mm. that's good. Well, I am actually completely on a mission in life to try and get behind the truth. And I think we, you're right. We hit on something today, which I hadn't thought about. It's the impermanence of love, that that is the quest. So I think there are two things, actually. It's the impermanence of love, the quest for permanence. And the search for what it is. Mm -hmm. what is how to it define actually? it. How to define it and how to find yeah. it. It's like you said earlier, the soul doesn't is not an organ. I mean, there are surgeons talking about that when they go, well, you know, I've cut someone open, they're lying on my surgery table and I'm poking things and the soul is nowhere. <laughs> it's not anywhere in the body. So it is a very interesting thing and fascinating to me and I may not be able to find the truth ever, but I'm going to try my best. <laughs> oh, wonderful. I wish you the best of luck. Let me know Thank when you, you do. <laughs> Thank you. And it well, was, it was lovely fun. to meet you. Really lovely to meet you. I'm so glad that you could join us. I really am. And people should buy your book and read it. I certainly am going to. Well, so, thank you. Yeah, it's lovely to meet you. Bye. You too. Bye-bye.